late in life, late in life is that the work of Kaabah, it was meant to start it off after the last lockdown, but it just got cut, cut off by the lockdown coming in with it. So uh, there's been a sort of time shifting a around this event. Um, and I'm looking around at, at the time shifting seems to be taking all the people to a much, much better home, unless it's in the steam thing where they can't even come out. Whereas last night, which was the first night, we were, we were full, so and we weren't screening, so maybe screening makes it rather easier for some people to go home. Anyway, I'm really pleased to be able to introduce Henry uh, Horn Gotham, who is the, um, she's the Director of Conservation at the Sussex Wildlife Trust. Now, there are some statistics about, uh, I can't say statistics, but I think <laughs> I shall avoid that. Um, statistics, I said, I said it right. Um, there are 35,000 members of the Sussex Wildlife Trust, but they're always looking for more members. So it's a good organization which is welcome more members, and I'm sure some of you may well be members. Um, it, in Sussex, it runs 37 uh, de reserves, nature reserves, which you can access, obviously. Um, there are 22, um, 22 is the time, is the length of time that Henry has been nailed down in Sussex Wildlife Trust. So she started as a, as a five-year-old, and she's been there now for 22 years. Um, there are 46 wildlife trusts in the UK, and as she said, I'm to tell you, it's one big family. <laughs> so, just like uh, word trust, just like word trust in England. Anyway, um, this is a really important um, project that I know Sussex Wildlife Trust have taken a long time to bring to fruition um, through a lot of trouble. And there are all sorts of exciting things I think are developing because of the, the uh, wonderful discovery that these eggs have taken. And I'm sure she's going to say more about those. Um, how we're going to run the evening is that um, Henry is going to talk for, I don't know, about something like 40 minutes. If we, we haven't got a stopwatch going. 40 odd minutes. Then we're going to have a break of, say, 15 minutes so you can refresh your drinks. Then there's just a little bit more and then you'll be primed to ask intelligent questions. <laughs> we, we thought that a second drink would probably help you uh, <laughs> contemplate uh, after that. Anyway, so Henry, she said I couldn't say any more about her, um, but uh, my good friend Henry. <laughs> Henry. <laughs> well, um, thank you very much, and it's just very exciting to be in a room full of people. It's quite overwhelming. So. Um, yeah, really lovely to see you all. Um, I'm going to put my stop clock on so that I know when I've gone on too long. There you go. And um, yeah, I'm going to be talking to you about rewilding Sussex seas. And as David said, I'm from Sussex Wildlife Trust, which the logo, as you can see, is not very marine. So my marine colleagues got a bit sick of doing talks about the marine environment with the badger on it. So they did a cuttlefish logo for the Wildlife Trust. So. I will slip that in from time to time. So anyway, what I thought I'd do in order to talk about rewilding the Sussex Seas was break it into three bits, basically. So I'm going to talk to you about Sussex Seas, what we know about Sussex Seas, um, set the scene. Then I'm going to talk about rewilding as a concept. Uh, some of you may have been to Tony Whitbread's talks where he's unpacked rewilding quite a bit, so I'm going to pick up on some of that and how rewilding relates to the marine environment. And then finally, I'm going to talk about kind of the big rewilding case study for Sussex, which, which is about restoring kelp. Um, and I just want to say right at the beginning, I'm not a diver. I hate swimming in cold water. So I am talking from about this. I'm a, I'm a bit of a land lover. However, I've 20 years plus working in nature conservation. And the last eight or so, I've been working um, on marine issues. And um, I'm not a marine scientist, but I work with a lot of marine scientists and I find them utterly fascinating and inspiring. So what I'm doing this evening is sharing with you some of the really interesting things I've learned over the years working with a whole range of people. Many of some people that I'm kind of using their inspiration this evening, they don't even know how much they've inspired me over the years. But there's a list of some of the people who I'm very grateful for the fact that they've kind of shared their knowledge and inspiration and passion with me over the years. So, also, one of the reasons for saying 
I'm not a diver or marine specialist. Is if your questions, if you have questions at the end and I can't answer them, I do reserve the right to go away, find out the answer, and get back to you. <laughs> so, setting the scene for Sussex Seas. Um, a warning. Hopefully, you will find this inspiring, but possibly you might find it a bit disturbing as well. I'm sorry. A bit sorry. So, when we're talking about nature in Sussex, when we're talking about the terrestrial environment, it will probably seem really logical to start with the geology. And from a land perspective, obviously you, you will all be able to relate to, oh yeah, the chalk of the South Downs, the clay of the High Weald, etc. And it's no different at sea. Um, the, I mean, for example, as you can see from this map, chalk is a, is a substrate that runs all the way through the UK. It actually... Um, goes under the channel, out the other side in the Champagne region, which is why we've got Sussex sparkling on this side of the channel and Champagne on the other side of the channel. It's exactly the same chalk, stream, ch chalk seam. Um, but it does give us this incredible chalk coast. Um, but it's not just a chalk coast. The diversity of geology that we have on land, and Sussex is really diverse geologically, more so than many other counties, um, that diversity also exists under the sea, and that diversity gives us this huge range of different substrates or types of seabed. Um, I'm now going to talk about something that I'm really absolutely not an expert in, and how we got the English Channel. So for <coughs> this, is, again, is something that is absolutely fascinating. So what's that, 450,000 years ago, uh, glacial melt was coming and collecting in a huge lake and then from that lake there was just a, a river a large river nonetheless coming where the English Channel is now so it was all basically you'd, you would be able to walk across to France no problem apart from there was a river in the way but not a sea, a river and we know this is true because of the gravels and alluvial deposits you get with rivers, they're still there um, so that's what the English Channel would have looked like all those years ago. Mammoths and whatever the other one is, an elk. Um, and then, um, as you can see, that river was fed into by the Rhine and all sorts of different rivers that exist now. Um, but at one point, that big lake overtopped. And when it overtopped, it overtopped roughly where the Straits of Dover are. And there was one almighty flood again which shows in all of our geological deposits that there was a massive flood event and that massive flood event basically made the English Channel and so the geology that we have on our seabed is a result of that long history we're going to do do a time warp here we're going to fast forward 20,000 years to now so we know a little bit quite a bit about the substrates that we have on our seabed and um, just to prove the point, here we are. Here is a mammoth tusk that was found by fishermen in Worthing um, in the 1920s. And here's a lad in Bexhill who relatively recently found a mammoth tusk on the beach in Bexhill. So they're there. And there's quite, quite a few mammoth tusks have been found over the years. Um, and another thing that's happened in that 20,000 years is an awful lot of people. So here we see West Sussex a lot of people. Here we see East Sussex, a lot of people. But as you can see, the density in both of those, the coastal populations are really large. And we, you know, vast amount of our population live in these coastal conurbations. Um, and those coastal conurbations as such, if you look at the history of them, they've largely grown up around the fishing industry or Victorian spa towns where people take the air. Um, so the sea has had a huge influence just on the, the way our kind of geopolitical lives exist to this day. So we've got 220 kilometres of coast. That's a long coast. And as I said, community is absolutely shaped by the sea. And a huge business turnover from visitors to coastal West Sussex. So in 2015, that was supporting 14,000 jobs. Probably a little bit different now post-pandemic, but... That's how important the sea is to our local economy. Um, we talked about the geology, and I'm going to talk about it in a relation to what we can all relate to, which is our beaches. So the shingle, when, once we talk about the creation of 
how the channel actually created. All of a sudden, the shingle, when you think about ancient riverbeds, etc., that starts making a bit more sense. Ancient deposits, they're there on our beach and we can relate to them. And here in Shoreham, you've got the absolutely fantastic vegetated shingle, a real um, a European speciality. There's like one of the best places in Europe is the West Sussex coast for uh, vegetated shingle. Um, and that shingle, obviously, is not just on the beaches, it goes under the sea as well. And similarly, sand, we've got sandy beaches in Sussex, which have their own diverse ecology. So from, from worms to mollusks to crustacea to birds feeding on it all, it's, ho it's a whole big food chain in its own right. So what happens in the sand on our beaches, obviously, offshore, you haven't got birds burying their beaks in, but you've got other creatures doing the same role. And then our rocky shores, which are really amazing for the diversity. Um, so, so many different species. I shouldn't think there's a single person in this room who's never rock pulled. Everybody's rock pulled. And if you haven't, you really should. Um, rock pulling is one way of engaging with nature I've never known to fail. Everybody just goes wow, and it brings out the seven-year-old in everybody. It's just amazing. And then, of course, the sea itself. The sea is kind of on from an ecological perspective, it's obviously a lot more than just the seabed. It's not just about what's lying there at, on the ground. It's also about the water column and the differences in that water column. So it's an absolutely multidimensional habitat. So all sorts of diversity within the sea, from fish to crustacea to marine mammals that sometimes live on land, and then occasional visitors like Linky Well, for example. And then when you start talking about the sea, you get exposed to a whole new language. So bathymetry, which is basically depth. So water depth. Now, quite, interest, quite interesting to me, the Sussex Seas, they're not really that deep. So um, all these areas out here, they're only 50 metres deep. The deepest we have in our area is 69 metres. So I was like, what does 69 metres really look like? Um, so I chose the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I mean, logic has got a picture with people at the bottom. It's, it's not that much deeper than the Leaning Tower of Pisa at its deepest, our bit of the channel. So, um, and that gives you a kind of essence of what this 3D habitat looks like. Um, and then also, I think quite interestingly, who owns the seabed? Well, actually, the Crown Estate owned the seabed. So it's not the Queen personally, it's the Crown Estate that just comes with the Crown. So it's part of our national treasure, I suppose. Um, so the Queen, in essence, the Crown, owns the entire seabed, the rights to the seabed, etc. Um, and when it comes to the management of the seabed or the marine area, we have what's called the near shore, which is be inside six nautical miles. And that's managed for the, so fisheries, for example, is managed by the Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authority, who I'm going to mention quite a bit in this. They're based in Shoreham. And offshore is managed by the Marine Management Organization. And the Marine Management Organization also are responsible for all planning issues in the marine environment. So it's, <coughs> it's completely different players when you get out to sea to the kind of organizations that we're used to on a land level. And then also obviously something offshore, something I've, I find really fascinating. All of these dots here are some, and by no means all, shipwrecks. So spanning hundreds of years, ever since there's been ships, there's been shipwrecks, unfortunately. And so ancient and more modern, these, these features are still on the seabed and, seabed, and each one of these in turn becomes its own nature reserve, attracting wildlife around it. And that in itself inspires so many divers in Sussex. There's a, Diving Sussex wrecks is, is a big thing. And I, uh, like I say, I'm not a diver myself, but I bet it's absolutely amazing. Um, similarly, diving for the purposes of recording nature is also a thing in Sussex. So we have Sussex Sea Search. Now, most counties, coastal counties around the UK, have what's called Sea Search, which are divers who have had some ecological training and they're doing a proper survey, taking notes, etc. And um, Sussex Sea Search has been going since the, I think, the mid-1980s, and it was the first one in the UK to be established. So we've got 
lots and lots of data about the Sussex marine environment. And 20 years ago, they put all their data together and all of the marine experts got together about marine wildlife and go, these are the sites in Sussex that we think are the most special for wildlife. And um, some of these will be wrecks, some of these are reefs, they're all sorts of different types of sites. So these are 20 years ago. I hope they all still exist now, but I do not know if they all exist now, because what level of protection do they get? Actually, it's just identifying the good bits. They have no statutory protection whatsoever. So that's not really enough, but it's good to know where the good bits are, I guess. However, in 2010, we had the Marine and Coastal Access Act, and that actually created <coughs> the drive for a whole suite of marine protected areas. So these are called marine conservation zones. So there was a big move um, following this act to recommend specific sites around the UK for marine conservation zones. And um, it was done in three phases. And um, in Sussex, we had marine conservation zones designated in each of those phases. Um, so in the first one, these might be sites that you know or heard of. So um, in the first tranche, 2013, Kingmere, which is off the coast of Worthing, um, that's where black sea bream breed and have their nests, a very fascinating site. Um, Beachy Head West, which is um, that whole stretch of from Brighton to Beachy Head, basically, um, where the chalk platform is and Pagham Harbour. So they were our first three. And then in the next phase, there's some more offshore sites. So offshore Overfalls, offshore Brighton, and Utopia. Now Utopia is a tiny little site. It's, well, tiny. It's three square kilometers. So it's quite big, if you think of it in land terms, but in marine terms, quite small. Um, and Utopia um, is particularly interesting. And it's called Utopia because it's where taupe sharks, taupe sharks come to breed every year. Um, so, really interesting site. So, East Meridian, that was a site it never got through. It never got designated because there's not enough data about it. And as you can imagine, these, these offshore sites, there is very little data about them. People don't dive that deep. And so, the, there just isn't enough information to uh, cause a designation. So, the fact that the other two, three offshore sites were designated is a really big deal. But in that third tranche, uh, Inner Bank, uh, Beachy Head East, and uh, also Selsey Bill and the Hounds were our designations. So that's Sussex, it's got more marine conservation zones than most. So we're pretty good. And Selsey Bill and the Hounds, there's so many different species you find there. But Seahorse is obviously the one we all get excited about because they are genuinely fascinating. So obviously, we've got fishing industry here in Sussex and so commercial fishing in itself is a is really interesting I've learned quite a lot over the years so for example these these dots on here these are the main fishing ports in Sussex um, and the size of the dot is the kind of size of the turnover that's going coming through these ports so in relation to each other um, so in 2018 which is the most recent data I had 27 million pounds worth of fish was going through these ports. Now, it wasn't necessarily all caught in Sussex, but it gives you a good indication of how important the fishing industry is in Sussex. Um, so there's all sorts of different types of fishing interests. I mean, the sea angling, there's a huge amount of people interested in sea anglers. In sea angling. There's probably sea anglers in the audience tonight. Um, there's dredging, netting, potting, trawling, um, and it's fish and it's shellfish as well. Um, so target species, um, things that are getting caught here in Sussex, bass, bream, cod, sole, herring, mackerel, place, crab, lobster, oysters, scallops, and the one that I find quite interesting is whelks, because I've never even seen whelks served in a restaurant in Sussex, but they are a big delicacy in other places. So there is a big market for whelk, which is, a, again, quite an important Sussex um, export, essentially. So. Our, our fleet here in Sussex is mainly made out of, of small small boats and um, they usually fish within six nautical miles, so in that near shore area. So um, like, like any 
kind of work that's relating to the national natural world, it is obviously going to be seasonal. Fish move around. There are wild, wild creatures. So they've got their own habits. And so fishing changes season to season on what's going on for that particular species. So in, in Sussex, one of the things that I think is of interest, we've got the largest um, UK beach-launched fishing fleet, which is in Hastings. And if any of you have been to Hastings for the day, you, you know that at the end of the seafront, you see all the boats, they're all the RX boats that are um, on the beach there or offshore. We've got a trawling fleet that operates in the region. We've also got scallop dredges that go out more to the middle of the channel for, for scallops. Another really major activity that happens in Sussex is, of course, dredging, and Shoreham being probably one of the major places for dredging um, boats coming in from Sussex. So we've got Hanson, Tarmac, um, Kendall Group. These are all aggregate companies based, based here. And 10% of the marine aggregate in the UK comes from Sussex. So we're really significant in the, um, in the industry. And you think that's every road, every building that's using aggregate, you know, a lot of that would have come from marine aggregate. So is it a one million, one, over a half, one and a half million tons, it's a, it's a lot. So when, next time you're walking up someone's driveway and it's a nice crunchy path like that, remember that you're actually looking at ancient geological process in place that's there that's been dredged out of our sea. So these are the Ice Age river deposits, flint, gravels, and sand that are, you know, a really huge industry. And then another main thing that we've got going on in our seas that, again, we've all seen is the Rampion wind farm. Now, that produces enough electricity for pretty much half of the population of Sussex. It's, it's quite amazing. What, what always interests me is they look so close, but they're not. They're... 13 to 20 kilometers offshore. They're absolutely humongous. That's why they look close. It's like Father Ted thing, small, far away. Yeah. They are absolutely huge. I think you can do boat trips and go out and, and look at the turbines, which I've never done, but it'd be really fascinating. So th obviously that's, that's happened relatively recently. So a big change in the way the seabed is being used. And another thing that, again, we probably don't appreciate enough that actually the English Channel is one of the busiest shipping lanes in the world. Um, there's actually an, a uh, website called uh, Boat, Boat Watch or something, but you can click any one of these, you can click on it and it tell you exactly which what boat it is and what it's doing. It's, yeah, really, really interesting. Um, but it's ferries, it's fishing boats, it's cargo ships, it's leisure vessels. There is a huge amount of activity. And that's kind of reflected in when you start looking at marine maps. So, wow, there's a lot going on. There you've got Kingmere, the orange stripy bit, and you've got the aggregate zones, you've got the wind farm area, uh, so much going on there. And, you know, here's just a little bit of the English Channel with all the shipping lanes and areas you can't do this and can do that mapped in. It's very busy. And, of course, that's not even including us, the people, Looking, I mean, for me, my main observation of the marine environment is just standing on the beach. But we have also a lot of marine users that are paddle boarding, kite surfing, sitting on beaches, uh, divers, etc. It's, you know, the sea is a passion for so many people. <coughs> However, all of these organisations here say, uh-uh, there's a lot of issues with the sea. So in uh, the State of Nature report, they state all of these issues as being major concerns, and every single one of them stands in Sussex as much as it stands anywhere else. We are no different to anywhere else. Um, and then, of course, the big one that's almost too big to mention is climate change. And the climate change, when you relate it to the marine environment, is a really, really big deal. Now... We've got 4,700 kilometres of rivers and streams in Sussex. We're a very, very soggy county. Everything that goes into those rivers and streams is going to be coming out here into our marine environment. So 
we all have a bit of responsibility to put what's, what's going in. And <coughs> we all know there's problems with misconnections and storm drains and all sorts of things about nutrients and you know, agricultural products that are making their way into water systems. All of that is going to impact what's going on in our marine environment. So those of you that did O-level or GCSE chemistry, this um, chemical, chemical equation may make sense to you. So carbon dioxide plus water goes to carbonic acid, which is, goes to a hydrogen ion and a bicarbonate ion. So that is ocean acidification. That hydrogen ion is the acidification part of the ocean acidification. Our carbon dioxide goes up in the atmosphere, the sea gets more acidic. And it's happening. It's not like it's not happening. It is actually happening. But that hydrogen ion, excuse me, is what is absolutely critical in the second chemical, chemical equation that is relevant to ocean acidification. Because, okay, so the pH of the sea is a little bit different. But what does that change in pH actually mean? Actually, more hydrogen ion, if you put that into connection with calcium carbonate, then you're going to get calcium plus bicarbonate. Now, any of you that has done that experiment to make a, a volcano with bicarbonate soda and vinegar, that's just the same thing, but really beefed up, I suppose. That acid plus calcium carbonate is gonna, gonna fizz. So as a result, your hydrogen ion goes up, your pH goes down. And that's what it looks like in a graph. But what does that mean for the ecology of the sea? Now hold on to your seats for this bit because this is the, dis the disturbing bit. Pretty much everything in the marine environment, in the kind of animal kingdom, has got a, sh a shell or a carapace that's made out of a calcium type structure. So if you've got a situation where calcium carbonate is not able to hold its form so well, then things just cannot exist in quite the same way. That is why we do not want the pH of the sea to go up any more than we can get away with. So please, everybody, let's all do everything we can do to stop it happening. Now, temperatures rising is another issue that of course you would have heard about. What does temperature rising mean in the marine environment? Now, <coughs> it changes the distribution of species and we're already seeing that. We do surveys um, at sea, we also do surveys on beaches and we are already seeing changes in distribution of species like snake lux and enemy. We see distribution in fish as well. Interestingly, when we talk about distribution of fish, it's not just their spatial distribution, you know, are they in Worthing, are they in New Haven? It's actually a depth thing as well. So things like cod, species like cod, they're now five and a half meters deeper than they used to be because they're going to where the water is the temperature that they like the water to be. So there's changes in depth of the way species are moving around. And also changes in migration. Now, um, these species, cuttlefish and bream, they uh, migrate on a nine degrees, nine degrees kind of contour, essentially. So when the nine degrees contour moves, they move with it. And of course, less oxygen, less food means smaller fish. So that's you know, another aspect. And then you've got species that don't have the ability to move, like seagrass, for example. So more storm damage and all of the other issues that those habitats can't move. And it's a real challenge for some of these more, those more static issues in the sea. Now, you might have heard about stratification, which is, a, I think is absolutely fascinating. We know that in the last few centuries, we've lost 90% of the whales. And that may feel like, you know, that's a, you know, that's an Arctic and an Antarctic and a Norwegian and a, you know, it's happening in all these different countries. But actually what the whales do is they mix up the sea. They take the nutrients, they move the nutrients from one layer of sea to another layer of sea. Lots of different species do that, but whales are obviously the most magnificent at doing this. And as we lose marine mammals, we lose that mixing up of the nutrients within the sea. And of course, everything comes down to plankton. So there is a massive statistic, and I'm not even going to pretend to know what it is, but it's just of every breath 
that you take, X amount of it has come from plankton directly. We need the plankton, and plankton is relying on that calcium carbonate as much as anything else. So, yeah, we need it. So, I, in summary, in talking about our Sussex seas, um, um, they're diverse, they're special, they're busy, and they're really challenged. So now I'm going to move on to part two of my talk, which is about rewilding in the sea. So when people talk about rewilding, I think most often they're talk they've been talking about rewilding on land, which is obviously fascinating. And here in Sussex, we're spoilt rotten because we've got the Nepa state, and it's fascinating and amazing and all these things. <coughs> I've... Um, recently listened to a talk by Alistair Driver from Rewilding Britain, and I was really interested in his definitions, which he was doing entirely on a terrestrial basis. And I said, right, how applicable is this to the marine environment? And the reason I had to go on this long preamble about Sussex Seas is because this is where we're going to link it back to what does rewilding look like in that context. So what is rewilding? So I'm going to use Rewilding Britain's uh, definition. So a large-scale restoration of ecosystems when nature can take the lead. Okay, sounds, sounds pretty good. So what do they mean by large-scale? So when they're rewilding Britain is talking about large-scale on land, they go at least 1,000 acres. Now, the Nepa state is 3,000 acres, if that gives you a bit of perspective. Um, but anything above 1,000 acres could potentially be a rewilding project. Um, what does that look like in the marine area? Well, Kingmere Marine Conservation Zone, which is off the coast of Worthing, where the black sea bream are making their nests, that is 10,000 acres. So the, the opportunity, you can see that the opportunities in the marine environment are absolutely huge. Um, and it talks about where nature takes the lead. I mean, kind of nature's in charge anyway, isn't it? But they look at it, it's like, well, when you get to the scale where you can measure the services and benefits that an area are giving you, that's when we're talking at scale, when nature is taking the lead. So that we'll come back to that later on when we talk about the kelp. So that's just to uh, illustrate what 10,000 acres looks like in marine environments. So that's the equivalent of 10 terrestrial uh, rewilding projects, essentially. So... That's the question. Aren't the seas wild already? I kind of... I've mulled over this a lot. And um, I was quite interested to listen to, again, to Rewilding Britain's interpretation of rewilding and then apply it back. So let's take a look at our protected areas. So for a marine protected area to work, we need it to be big enough. So our NCZ, some of them are quite decent size. Close enough. Mm. That could mean different things for different species. It's very different from a lugworm than it is for a taupe shark, for example. They need to be representative of all the different diversity of habitats that we have, numerous enough, and actively protected. So on one, two, three, and four, well, one, probably a tick, but two and three and four, borderline, but actively protected, no, sadly not. Only we've we already know that our sites for nature cons conservation importance, they're not protected at all. So, and they don't even have boundaries, they're just dots on maps. And as for the marine conservation zone, East Meridian didn't even make it in, and that's the biggest one. But <coughs> only a couple of those have got management measures in place for them. And you probably heard recently about uh, activity in offshore Brighton. Um, which was all about the need for our marine protected areas to actually have protection and not just be a boundary on a map. So that's why organisations are really passionate about, come on, we've got these marine protected areas now, but can we please protect them, put the, the P into MPA, I suppose. And um, what about if we look at our best bits? Now, um, you could say one of the best bits is Chichester Harbour, which I'm sure many of you know. It's absolutely beautiful. However, it's got every single designation that a site can have. Yet, seabirds are in decline, salt marsh is in decline, seagrass is decline, water quality from upstream 
is a real issue. So this is one of our best bits, and we can't even fly its flag and go, it's amazing. We can fly the flag and go, this is a site that's got some serious problems. We know it can be amazing, and let's make it amazing, but our best bits aren't as good as they should be, even nearly. Another aspect um, which we wilders refer to, and I think in nature conservation we refer to generally, is a thing called shifting baseline. Um, there's a really brilliant publication by the Sussex Inshore Fisheries Conservation Authority called Centuries of Sussex Seas. I could sit and read the whole thing. It just goes through all of the anecdotal reporting about fishing in Sussex over hundreds of years, starting from medieval times to modern day. Really, really interesting. So in the 1800s, for example, just to start us off, fishing boats so heavy with fish they could not be landed on the beach. Okay, that sounds good. So that was a long time ago, 1800s. Let's come a bit more recent, 1980s. So in 1980s, a dense bed of kelp occurred very close in shore between Shoreham and Bognor Regis. This kelp bed was so dense that it often required fishers to row for 10 to 15 minutes past the kelp before firing up their engines, as the kelp fronds would become tangled around their propellers if they tried to use their engines. That was in the 1980s. So these kelp beds, we're going to talk about a little bit later, but I think what's particularly interesting when you talk about shifting baseline quite often is like, well, how do you know? How do you know it was better then than it was now? So one fisherman um, in the 1980s has reported on how much he caught in that area in the 1980s with how much effort. So when he was reporting again in 2017, it's a fraction of the same catch for a massively larger effort. So we can see the shifting baseline can happen just in 40 years, between now and the 1980s. Another example that particularly kind of touched me, I suppose, was this piece about oysters. Um, so in 1816, new oyster beds were discovered off the south and southwest of Brighton. Over the next few years, these newly discovered oyster beds were extensively mapped and found to cover an area of seabed over 70 miles long and seven miles wide. Where are they now? So that's a huge habitat that we now have got only remnants of. And, you know, now having native oysters is a reason to, you know, it's a designated feature in a protected area when, you know, before it was vast stretches of our Sussex seabed. So all of this is happening and this is what we see. This is what I see. It's just, it's beautiful. We go to the beach, we go to Shoreham, and Shoreham is beach, is the beach I go to most often, and it's where you go to relax and look at views and be in the wind and weather, and it, it's brilliant. It's beautiful. But that leaves the sea out of sight and out of mind, and that's the um, expression I'm going to come back to a little bit later on, because out of sight and out of mind, we... I'm not, I can't put us all collectively in the land lovers. Me, as a land-based person, um, I can't see what's going on underneath the sea. I'm not a diver, and so it's just what I see. I see the surface of the sea. The beach looks nice. Is that enough? So then there's a question. Is rewilding about looking back? So if we take a look at our marine protected areas, obviously, we've now ascertained they're not enough. Shifting baseline... Yes, we can see that actually what used to be there is incomparable to what we've got now. Pressures on the sea. We've identified huge amounts of pressures on the sea. Global pressures, local pressures. And all of this means we've got reduced services and benefits coming from the sea. So ecosystem services coming from the sea is much, much depleted, let's say. So actually when we're looking at rewilding in the marine environment, we could say it's about being fit for the future. It's about having a natural environment that can stand the pressures and changes that we all need to stand. Um, the key principles of rewilding, I think, again, quite interesting. People are key. Now, we've already talked about the amount of marine users 
and marine lovers that we have in Sussex, people dependent, the economy dependent on the marine environment. So absolutely, size matters. So we've already kind of covered that actually the scope for scale in the marine environment is epic. And then also thinking about natural processes and this very interesting concept, it's a marathon with a sprint start. So remember that phrase and I'll come back to that. So thinking about natural processes, um, natural processes, um, for any of you that have seen Tony Whitbread's talk on um, rewilding, he describes it absolutely fantastically. Um, as natural processes, you can look at them as succession or you can look at them as disturbance. And so I was quite interested. Well, in the terrestrial environments, you need healthy soils, which leads to the growth of your kind of your herb layer and your shrubs, and that will lead to your canopy. And that is what succession looks like on a, um, in a very simplistic way, on a terrestrial um, environment. And what does disturbance look like? So you need disturbance, which is impacting that succession. And the balance between the two is where the real development of a rich biodiversity exists. So large herbivores and predators are th where the rewilding focus is very much on getting that um, disturbance absolutely, absolutely balanced so that you have the full process to get that natural process. What does it look like in the marine environment? So succession, you need healthy seabed, which will start off developing soft corals, for example, sponges, and then onto algae. So that's what your succession kind of would look like on the seabed. But then what's disturbance? The disturbance on the seabed is actually reduction in the man-made disturbance because there is so much going on on the seabed. So the kind of what constitutes succession and, nat and natural processes, et cetera, in the marine environment is very, very different. So when we're talking about rewilding Sussex seas, so we'll go back to talking about the shifting baseline. Where did all that kelp go? Back to our sea search divers who've got 40 years worth of data. What have we done with it? And back to the need for more areas that are protected. So I'm going to talk now a bit about the Sussex kelp, which is our kind of big example, our big once in a lifetime opportunity, I suppose, for, for lots of us to yeah, be involved in something really at scale for the natural environment. So the sea search data, those volunteer divers, the map on the, I don't know if that's the left or the right, left. <laughs> Is that left? Well, that map over there, that's where the kelp used to be. Now it was um, from that anecdotal information that I gave earlier on that described it. This is from the data we have, this is where we identified it was. Now from the data we have now, this is where it's left. And I would say that is rather a generous map of where it's left. And um, we in Sussex have what the Sussex Inshore Fisheries Conservation Authority. And they are responsible for fisheries management in the near shore area. With this information and an understanding of what the fishing pressure is in Sussex, they have a process where they create, they can create fisheries management through the bylaw process. And so they did something that's never been done before, as far as I understand, is they took what's called a natural capital approach to the uh, creation of a bylaw, where they looked at the ecosystem services that could be improved or had been lost and how fisheries management was impacting those ecosystem services. And um, so they went through a consultation process for this. And as a result of their research, they, they established that what they wanted to do was to create a bylaw where trawling, which is the dragging of heavy fishing gear across the seabed, would be pushed back four kilometers off the Sussex coast. Now, the area in East Sussex actually already had trawling bylaws in place, so we're really talking about that wider area in West Sussex where trawling would be pushed back. So to enable the seabed to regenerate and to enable 
this, some of these lost habitats to return. So this is where I go into this kind of the human story of it. So what a difference a cup of coffee can make. So here's Sean. He's the deputy chief at Sussex Ithaca. And he was sitting at his desk one day and the phone rings. And it's this lady here. She lives at Chichester Harbour. She's really frustrated about bait digging in Chichester Harbour. And so she's ringing up to say, what are you doing about the bait digging at Chichester Harbour? He says, well, actually, I'm going to be in Chichester Harbour next week or whenever it was. If you want, we can meet up, have a cup of coffee, and I'll tell you exactly what we're doing about bait digging in Chichester Harbour. So they do. They meet up. They have a cup of coffee. They talk about bait digging. When they finish talking about bait digging, then she goes, so tell me a bit more about Sussex Ithaca. What's, what's big at Sussex Ithaca at the moment? He goes, well, actually, we're just about to start a formal consultation on um, this bylaw to push trawling out. Now, who is Sarah? This is Sarah. This is Sarah Cunliffe, who he was speaking to, who happens to be a diver who dived in the 1980s in the kelp forest. She remembered it really, really well. And she'd so, what, you mean it's not there anymore? He's like, no, it's not there, it's gone. And she's like, oh my God, that's absolutely shocking. Not only is Sarah an ex-diver, she also is the creative director of a TV production company, or a film production company called Big Wave TV. And she was so moved by what Sean was telling her about the kelp not being there anymore and the impact that trawling was, was having on the seabed that she's like, I will do everything I can to help you with this and so she literally within four weeks had made a film she had used her contacts in the film industry so she had one of the blue blue planet cameramen coming doing filming getting footage from elsewhere putting it all together made an amazing film <coughs> um, we got together with her as Sussex Wildlife Trust and other NGOs which were all ready to help our kelp essentially and she created this incredible film and then having created the film she was like hmm I wonder if and so she went do you know what I'm going to ask him so she got in touch with David Atterbury and she said we've made this film look here it is here's a rough cut would you be interested in narrating it for us and of course he probably gets asked all the time to get involved in all sorts of things and the next day she had a phone call and she had a missed number, and she goes, oh, I had a missed call, who is this, please? And she goes, it's David. She goes, David who? And it was David Attenborough calling back to say, yes, of course I'll do your film, this sounds amazing. And um, so he did, he narrated our film about the um, Sussex kelp and the bylaw and the consultation process. And obviously for those of us working in the kind of lobbying campaign around this, it was like amazing, because he's, I think probably for all of us, our hero on so many different levels. Um, but actually, there is, there is most definitely a David Attenborough kind of ripple effect. So I think, personally, that the, um, the Blue Planet series just awakened a whole wave of awareness of plastics in our oceans, for example. And there's a Blue Planet factor. The Blue Planet factor... I think has done a huge amount to raise awareness of the plight of our coral reefs and how incredible it is in the Galapagos. But what's that look like back home? And I think what he probably recognises, this is what Blue Planet looks like when you bring it back home. And to the fact that the film was made with one of the Blue Planet cameramen makes it a sort of a full circle, I suppose. I'm not going to show you the film um, because I'm... I'm hoping lots of you have seen it already. It's about seven and a half minutes long. If you just put in Help Our Kelp into Google, it should come up. It's this wonderful film that Sarah made. But as a result, when the formal consultation for the bylaw went out, um, normally bylaws, not a huge amount of response, uh, not a huge amount, but as, as a result, probably, of David Attenborough, actually raising the profile of this campaign two and a half thousand people responded to the bylaw supporting that process saying yes this bylaw is brilliant we really really want this and um so then what happened is 
the Sussex IFCA, when they create a bylaw, it's an absolutely fully democratic process. It's formal consul informal consultation followed by a formal consultation, which then goes to the board, then it gets voted by the board, etc. So in January 2020, a real milestone, the Sussex IFCA board voted for, yes, we want this bylaw. And then you go into a whole new process. So we start with, off with IFCA, they make a bylaw. And David Attera, thankfully, narrates a film all about it. This then goes to the Marine Management Organisation, and they have to check all the wording and the principles and make sure that everything is as it should be. When the Marine Management Organisation are finished with it, you move on to DEFRA, and then they have to go check all the legal frameworks and stuff around it. So there's a process there. And then when they finish with it, it goes to this guy, George Eustace, who's the Secretary of State for the Environment. And ultimately, he signs it off. Now, um, signing off bylaws is a bit of an unknown quantity. It can take three months, it can take three years. We were really keen to see this bylaw signed off as soon as possible. So the best way to do that is to show local support. So there was a lot of local support. I tried to find a little icon of little letters flying to him, but so many people wrote to him and emailed him from national organisations, local businesses, local NGOs, national NGOs, all of our Sussex Coastal MPs, even the non-coastal MPs were going and knocking on his door to say, what are you going to do about this Sussex bylaw? The support from our local MPs has been absolutely amazing. And not only were we contacting him, also fisheries ministers and senior DEFRA ministers, so I'm sure when it got signed off, he was probably just get this Sussex lot off my back. So it was amazingly signed off about seven weeks ago. And so the bylaw is now in place, which means that the Sussex IFCA implement that bylaw. So there is now no trawling in that area. So it goes back from him, straight back to IFCA for them to implement the bylaw process. So we as organisations, everything that we're doing in the, what we call the Help Our Kelp campaign is based around IFCA as a statutory body. They have their job as a statutory body. We as NGOs and others, we're not statutory bodies, but we've got other things that we can do so that we can all bring something to the table. So we're working very closely with the Marine Conservation Society, Big Wave Productions, which is Sarah Cunliffe, who I mentioned earlier on, the Blue Marine Foundation, which are a national marine organisation, amazing organisation, Sussex Wildlife Trust, amazing organisation, and uh, the University of Portsmouth, uh, Dr Ian Hendy is our, our science lead. And together, what we've managed to achieve, I suppose, is so many active supporters. So we've got, uh, I think, about 2,000 people who have signed up for updates about the Sussex kelp so they can stay up to date with what's going on. We've got a science group that's made up of academics from across South Coast universities all working together in shared academic ventures to find out more about the kelp. And um, strategic stakeholders. There are so many organisations just here in Sussex that are so supportive of this process and all got a piece of the jigsaw. And a very enthusiastic public. So when the bylaw was announced seven or so weeks ago, I've never known as much press coverage. It was in the Times, The Guardian, um, the Evening Standard, West Sussex Gazette, Shoreham Herald, everywhere. It was amazing for, for such a story to make it into the mainstream media, So, which is really, really exciting. A real appetite for it. And the project background all sits on that basic principle that the Sussex IFCA went into this process looking at a natural capital approach to a fishing bylaw process. Vital nursery grounds for fish, crucial habitat for a whole host of marine species, a productive and diverse ecosystem. It's one of the most diverse ecosystems on the planet. Um, and just a little bit about what is kelp. Kelp is not a plant, it's an algae. So, um, as someone who I've always fancied myself as a bit of a botanist, and so when it comes to kelp, I really don't know. It's an algae. They look, kelp looks like a plant, but it's just not. So it's got whole different systems. It reproduces differently to plants, and you know, 
it doesn't have a root, it has holes past, but it can form dense forests. And many of you would have seen incredible documentaries where the kelp's waving around and seals are swimming around. That's probably giant kelp, which is what you get off the coast of California, South Africa, Tasmania, for example. Really staggering species. I think there's 14 species of kelp, I think. What's quite interesting about kelp is take buttercups, for example, all the buttercups, again, I don't know, maybe 10 different species of buttercups, but they're all quite similar. You can tell they're, you can tell they're buttercups, but they're all quite similar. The thing is about kelp, they're really different, um, which makes them, um, I think, particularly fascinating. Um, they form dense forests, and as we said, really, really productive. But the, the kelp we get in Sussex is not the giant kelp of California. It's beautiful and exciting, but it's not. It's not 30 foot tall. Um, as you can see, it likes temperate waters, so you don't get kelp in the kind of equatorial or the tropics, but in those uh, more temperate waters. And um, it's like all habitats, sadly, there is quite significant loss because of all those pressures on the marine environment areas where there are kelp, many of them have been really, really challenged. Um, I think when we think of kelp in a UK context, we think of the, you know, the Western Isles of Scotland or the coast of Northern Ireland where there's absolute abundance of kelp. It's uh, not so here in the southeast of England. Um, not so here at all. We're just one tiny little dot on the south coast. But as you can see, quite a bit around the UK. Um, so the anatomy of this kelp, as I said, it looks like a plant, but it's not a plant. So we don't say leaf, we say blade, we don't say stalk, we say stipe, and we don't say root because it's absolutely not a root, it's a holdfast. So unlike a plant that's drawing up nutrients from the ground, a, a um, <coughs> kelp doesn't do that at all. It looks like a root, but it's just holding it in place. And it's drawing its nutrients actually from the water around it. It's what's called an ecosystem engineer. And as an ecosystem engineer, that's telling us that it is changing. As a result of being kelp there, it's changing so many other aspects of the natural environment. So lots of reasons. So diverse ecosystems. And we'll just kind of dig into that a little bit. So because of the structure of kelp and the fact that it grows in forests, it creates a sheltered area, you know, where these species can come and they can hide, for example. So, for example, you would expect crustacea, for example, things like lobsters, would really benefit from that canopy that the kelp forest provides. And other species like crabs, which we know are really important species in Sussex commercially, and species that live on all different as aspects. So blue rayed limpets is exactly what you'd expect to find on kelp. This is a really rare, incredibly beautiful species that we get in Sussex. And where you get a diversity of species, you get the whole food chain. So your predators are going to be there too. And you know, we actually have quite a few species of shark in Sussex. And this is just a small spotted cat shark. Um, and you can see their cases on beaches, but they're they're here in Sussex, and that's exactly the sort of species that will be using our kelp forest. Um, and much like if you imagine a rainforest, you have the canopy and what goes on in the canopy, so you, all your parrots and birds and monkeys in the canopy, but then you have what's going on on the forest floor. And similarly with kelp, you have a whole huge amount going on in the forest floor. Um, so, And this is what the holdfasts look like. So um, they, in their own right, are creating another ecosystem in, in and amongst them. So they're talked about as being a nursery ground for juvenile fish. And when you think of that, that mass of different niches that they're providing, it becomes quite, quite clear, of course, this is where fish are going to come and lay their eggs. This is where they're going to be more sheltered. Where predators are less likely to find them. So you have the kelp provides that environment and you know kelp isn't the only thing that provides juvenile um, nursery ground you've got salt marsh 
uh, seagrass. These are all places which are providing nursery grounds, which is why they're such important habitats. And of course, when, when we talk about nursery grounds for fish, our commercial species, are, they are wild creatures. So it's nursery ground for some of our commercial species. So this is really good, ultimately, for pumping those fish out of the trawling exclusion zone and out to where it is okay to be catching fish. And of course, the trawling exclusion zone is only for trawling. Other fishing is going on in the area. So static fishing nets, i.e. not being dragged across the seabed, are being used in this area. And potting is being done in the area as well. So it's not an exclusion of all, all fishing at all. And kelp also cause, creates a natural flood defence because of its impact on the sea, the kind of shape and flow of water over the seabed. Now, again, lots of research has been done on the impact of giant kelp on wave activity in Tasmania, but that's not going to be the same in our English Channel waters off the coast of Sussex. So this is something we've really got our eye on. Now, the Environment Agency have day in, day out, hour by hour, probably minute by minute data about the waves coming across the beach all across Sussex. They've got buoys measuring wave movement all the time. So what we're going to be able to do is when the when more kelp is in place is actually see is it making a difference to waves is it protecting our west sussex coastline because our west sussex coastline is going to need some protection so if the kelp can add anything to that that's amazing and the big one the one that really has got captured people's imagination is about the carbon from kelp now kelp is not trees trees sequester carbon and they lock that carbon in kelp sequesters it draws down carbon but it's what's known as a carbon conveyor belt so it's a different carbon narrative essentially it draws it down but of course it doesn't have a root and when the uh, every year the kelp kind of breaks away then where does it go does it go to the deep sea is it nibbled and eaten by fish species that are using that area where does it go we don't really know where the Sussex kelp goes. So we have got some research that's going to be starting um, early next year or late this year that's going to start looking at where the kelp carbon goes. Because obviously, we, as humans on planet Earth, want the natural world to draw down as much carbon as possible. So we need to know where it's going. Um, and it's what's known as a nature-based solution. Nature-based solution is where nature has got answers to our climate situation our climate crisis that are both about mitigating and adapting to climate change and restored kelp has all of those things now i'm not expecting you to read all of this so please don't um but i've just wanted to go through there are four ambitions of the help our kelp partnership so um david i completely lost track of time so if i'm going if you want me to stop just say I didn't hear any of that. Sorry, you said just Shall we have a break now? Yeah? yeah? And then I've probably got 10, 15 minutes after that. I'll leave it on a nice picture. Yeah. And we'll have a break now. And thank yeah. you very much.
put the kind of trawling thoughts over there, actually, what are the other impacts, the other disturbances to the seabed that we need to think about? So we're quite interested in some of the sedimentation issues that are happening off the Sussex coast. So that's the sort of issues we're going to kind of be looking at now. Um, to understand the ecological, social and economic value of kelp and the Sussex Ithaca nearshore trawling bylaws. So what impact is a bylaw having? Can we measure that? Can we demonstrate that? Sometimes, as I've said, we don't even know what the ecological processes are that are happening. So we don't know the story with carbon. We don't know what's happening there. So we need to understand some of these processes so we can explain what the benefits are. So how much carbon has been sequestered as a result of the bylaw? We can't tell you that now. But hopefully in a few years' time, when we've done research and understood a bit more about blue carbon from East, like English Channel kelp, then we'll be in a different position. But lots of research and monitoring and benchmarking so we can measure change. So reseeding. Now, you would have heard in um, rewilding projects, there's a big, like, introducing species into it. They're going to introduce beavers, etc., etc. Actually, in the Sussex kelp, are there areas of the seabed that have been so damaged by the activities that have taken place there that the kelp's just not going to regenerate for a long time. So this is what we're going to start to understand. The survey's taking place to understand more detail about the seabed, to understand what's happened to the substrate over the years, and to get exactly the locations of the existing kelp that we have. So, and if you do reseeding, now which has been done in other places in the UK and in other places in the world, how do you do it in the English Channel, where the water can be quite murky because of the chalk, for example, what, how does it work? Um, so understanding that. And then also to communicate all of this exciting stuff. The reason why the kelp went is because it was out of sight, out of mind. And we don't want it ever to be out of sight and out of mind again. So <coughs> a big part of what we want to do is just tell the story of the kelp, to get people involved in this really incredible journey, watching a habitat change, which doesn't belong to any one organisation or any one person. This is absolutely everybody's in really incredible natural habitat regeneration. This, isn't, this is nature's recovery, and it's here happening in Sussex. So as I have mentioned, we have our science group, which is made up of universities from across the South Coast, and a really fascinating array of science happening as a result of the bylaw. I mean, these are just the things that are being looked at or already funded already. So um, there's a transect, 27 passes of the West Sussex coast with a camera on a sledge towed across with computer analysis of what the seabed is doing. I don't think it's just computer analysis. I think an MSc student has to sit and watch and interpret these hours of footage about the seabed to see exactly what's going on on the seabed. We've got a PhD that's looking into the carbon cycle of the kelp and also looking at how kelp draws in um, other nutrients like phosphates and nitrates, looking at the feasibility of reseeding techniques, regular dives on known areas of existing kelp and areas where there aren't known areas of existing kelp to see is it spreading, what's the changes. Um, training new sea search divers. We already have a merry and happy band of sea search divers, but we could always do with more. Um, Tagging key species to find out how they're using the area. Really interesting piece of work with the University of Plymouth and understanding the genetics of UK kelp as well. Also very important. And also that's all ecological stuff and that is also, that's not everything that will be happening but some of the really fascinating stuff. There's also the socioeconomic benchmarking, not just ecological benchmarking. So what are the, what are the changes in catches as a result? Are we getting more lobsters? In Lime Bay, for example... Um, there was this trawling exclusion, and after four years, there was four and a half times better lobster catches as a result of the trawling exclusion. What does, what's that going to look like in Sussex? Um, what's people's perception of kelp? What do people think about this? Are they excited? I mean, everything we've seen so far tells us that people are really excited about this. And what is there an impact on the local economy? Maybe not now, but maybe in the future. <coughs> And also, we have a huge raft of current stakeholders. Um, organisations 
Sussex organisations that are just so passionate about making this happen, making it work, wanting to be part of this. Um, these are just some of the organisations that are Sussex stakeholders along with the Help Our Kelp partners, but there are loads more as well. And that in itself is really exciting. So at the moment we're consolidating the information, we're bringing together partners, we're dovetailing into existing projects to make sure nobody's unnecessarily repeating stuff. Um, and that in its own right is a pretty exciting piece of work. Lots of this costs money, so we're looking at who could, who can pay for this bit and who can pay for that bit. What money have we already got that we can target towards this kelp? So we're, we're kind of matching up funders and projects all in one go. And we're establishing that baseline. And the baseline information is really important, the benchmarking. Where did we begin so that we can look back in five years and ten years and we can tell you what's happened? And I think that will be really exciting. And creating a really clear shared plan of action between all of those organisations and individuals that want to be part of this. Um, restored habitat, we don't, we don't know. What's that going to look like? So future plans, we carry on gathering the evidence. We tell the story, always tell the story because there's going to be change all the time. And what are we learning? What are we finding out? We want to engage local communities and that's all different types of communities all along our coast and work with all these different organisations. But the most important thing, <coughs> long list of our future plans, but upholding the bylaw is the most critical thing, out and out. We need to demonstrate all along that this bylaw doing creating fisheries management through a natural capital approach, we want to demonstrate that that really works and, you know, with luck, inspire other areas that actually that's something that they want to do as well. And I've got a short film, so if you could hit the button. This was filmed in April this year by Dr. Raymond Ward, who lives, um, I think, near Widewater. And he dives regularly to look at known patches of kelp and has been recording them for quite some time. But this is new growth of kelp. So the stuff he's showing here in this film is kelp that was not there last year. This is, this is what the regeneration of the seabed looks like. It starts off gentle and we'll see more and more of this sort of thing in the Sussex seabed. Being a spider crab. I'm not a diver, so I get complete thrill out of this. Irritated cuttlefish. More kelp. So he's saying that he's seeing a really good rate of growth in the kelp as well. So if you want to uh, see stuff like this, then. Um, Either, you know, if you're not, if you're like me and you're not a diver, then we will be sharing as much as we can through social, social media, etc. If you are a diver, can you pop down to the next slide? Thank you. Um, if you are a diver, then please get involved in the um, sea search dives. Come and come and see this stuff and help record. Um, but help our kelp is just one piece of the jigsaw when we're talking about rewilding the seas. There's Medmory, which is an incredible project in the far west of Sussex, which I've got a couple of pictures of. Chichester Harbour, I've mentioned. Like the, there's so much that we can all do together as stakeholders in Chichester Harbour. There's salt marsh to restore in Sussex and to create in Sussex. There's seagrass. We want to really take a good look at sedimentation and the impact that that's having on our natural habitats. All of this depends on sustainable coastal economies and it all also depends on local pride as well because out of sight and out of mind is what we don't want we everybody in sussex knows about the south downs and goes oh yes we've got a national park we've got the south downs but actually how about if everybody in sussex goes we've got the national park we've got the south downs and we've got an amazing restored kelp forest because that's what makes sussex amazing so yeah we really want to make sure we get that foster that local pride um just so I don't just talk about kelp, just very quickly and finally. Medmory is the largest in West Sussex near Selsey. It's the largest coastal realignment project in the UK. And um, 
there it is as agricultural land, and there it is a few years later, letting the sea in and seeing what happens. And change happens so quickly. Nature takes a hold so quickly. And within um, just a couple of years, they had 50 sharks feeding on crabs in the shallow waters of Medmory. Absolutely amazing. It blew everybody's mind. It was in the Daily Mail. Um, but it's a really amazing place. It's the RSPB manager. It's an amazing place to go and visit and watch it as the tides come and change. There's other brilliant coastal places you can go to in Sussex. In the far, far east, Rye Harbour. Go and visit Rye Harbour and see some of the amazing coastal um, habitats and environments there. So that's it from me about rewilding our Sussex seas. Just to say, if you're not a member of the Sussex Wildlife Trust, perhaps you'd like to join. But thank you very much indeed. Um, that, that was a, a complicated for me uh, introduction. Uh, my knowledge of kelp was fairly minimal. It was the sort of thing that got wrapped around my legs when I was swimming and annoyed me. It might have been what annoyed other people too. So learning to be excited about kelp, uh, which I have been uh, by this discussion, and the opportunities for kelp, and the things that I take for granted living on shore and beach, <laughs> like others do here, uh, I think has really reminded me of, uh, of a, a whole world uh, that we need to regard in, in different ways. And the application of rewilding to the sea, I think, is, is a, a really... Initially, it does come as a mental struggle, because we think of, of the sea as, as already a wild place. Knowing that we ignore it and, and the damage that's been done to it um, is, 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 is truly shameful. Um, there's a process. We can now ask uh, Henry uh, questions. Lots of questions may come to mind, but... Um, I, the process that we have to go through is that um, if you have a question, I'll, I'll come to you. You tell me what your question is. So for hygienic reasons, I then repeat it. In the, so this microphone do doesn't become um, <laughs> besmirched, I think is the word I was looking for, <laughs> unnecessary besmirch in, in COVID terms. I know it sounds curious. But uh, people may have a, a few questions from what's been a really comprehensive and, and exciting presentation. Is, is there a question, someone who's got a question? Right, thank you. Uh, you can just repeat it. Right, I can repeat this one. It's, can you transplant kelp? Can you transplant kelp? Can you move it from one place to another? Um, yes, if you take the substrate with it, because it's on a hold fast. Um, so yes, I expect you can. And when we, we this PhD that's going to look into the feasibility of reseeding, it, I think it'll probably look at all the different ways you can do it. I mean, one of the ways that's been used is spores on ropes. Another way is putting spores onto gravel. So it's called green gravel. Um, there's so many, so many different arts of the possible. But what will work here is the question. Right. Now, that's a question. You used to see a lot of stuff washed up on Worthing Beach. <laughs> was that kelp? Um, it was as a result of the kelp. So it might not have been kelp, because when the storms come, it, kelp, as I was saying, it, it's an ecosystem engineer. It creates lots of habitat. So there's lots of seaweeds attached to the stipe of the kelp. So in storm conditions, that gets ripped off the kelp. So you get all sorts of different seaweeds washing up in storms. And that was a, a big thing on the Sussex coast when we still had a kelp forest. Um, so that's something we really got our eye on for the future, is what are the systems to get in place so that once we do have a restored kelp forest, people don't go, this bloody kelp washing up on our beaches, making it stinky. Actually, we've thought about all of that already and we've got a system because, you know, there's so many things you can do with kelp from soil conditioner, uh, fertilizer, um, feed for cattle, so it reduces their carbon emissions. 
you name it, kelp can do it. So um, there's, we're quite interested in what that could look like in the future. Right, uh, another question. The four kilometre band that is in East Sussex that prevented trawlers, um, first of all, did that, is there some evidence from that, that trawler band already um, in terms of the effect on, on, on the seabed? And has that helped you shape the, the is it the five metre or the six metre? That's a good question. Um, For this lady here. So the trawler exclusion zone in East Sussex isn't because of kelp, it's because of other habitats. It's because of, I think, the sensitive chalk habitats that you have in that area in the chalk reef. So um, the kelp hasn't been monitored specifically in those areas and what the impact has been. So I can't answer that question, sorry. This was a longer question, but is there a commercial application for the sort of algae that we get off the coast? So is it the commercial use uh, applied to the, the, this, this particular form of algae? Um, so at the moment, it's our dream to have enough kelp that there could be a commercial application. But as I was saying before, um, we're hoping that prior to there being lots of kelp washed up or before when the I mean, when we've got kelp growing readily and abundantly in our seas, um, the commercial applications are all sorts of different ways with seaweed. I mean, there's there's incredible stuff with plastics now in seaweeds. Like, I mean, Notpla is a UK company that's doing amazing stuff, um, creating little sachets for ketchup and stuff so that uh, takeaway food is no longer got its sachets in plastic, it's got seaweed-based stuff. Um, there's incredible stuff you can do with seaweed, and the innovation is changing all the time. Now, obviously, the reason why we have a bylaw is for the natural, the natural regeneration and the kind of creation of habitat for all of the ecosystem reasons. But we don't know what that's going to look like in the future in terms of uses, particularly of the kelp that's washed up on the beach. Um, so, circular economy. I think it's all to all to play for. Question here: um, Is there a proposal to extend the trawler uh, demarcation area, the restriction area, and uh, what specific wildlife position on that? Um, no, I don't think there's any uh, proposals to extend the area because the the area that's proposed it relates to where the kelp used to be, and also kelp beyond a certain depth, you're not going to get kelp. So the trawler exclusion zone, I don't think there's any any proposals to make it more than what it is now. Uh, simple question here. When and how does the kelp uh, produce its seed? When and how does the kelp produce its seed? It doesn't have seed, it has spores. Spores, I, I'm spores. sorry, he meant spores. Um, <laughs> <laughs> As I said, I'm a bit more of a botanist than an algaeologist, so um, I'll let you go home and Google that. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just make a, a, a last comment? Uh, I think, it, unless there's a, a last question, just, just a last comment. Um, in, in places like... Uh, this, this coast, it w was famous for its seafood I in the past. Um, I mean, many of those oyster shells that we're picking up on the beach now are clearly those from when we had these huge oyster beds out, 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 oh. out to sea. Um, in some ways, uh, uh, some seafood used to be probably more popular in the 50s than it is, is now, and in other countries, um, but like Ireland, uh, when you went there in the 70s, people didn't eat seafood because it was famine food. That's what the poor people... Now people collect mussels, cockles, and there's a huge market, market for them. But th there's never... It, it, in Britain today, the, the market for 
seafood it has been reducing over a, p a period of time. You know, we, uh, the fish shops that we used to see on the corners are, are less familiar. So is there a real sense from the inshore fisheries that we're going to see uh, a resurgence on, on uh, near coast fisheries again? Is that, that one of the, the yeah. things that we, we're expecting in the longer term? I think that would be amazing. I, I always think if you went to Lyme Regis or you went to Cornwall on holiday, you probably wouldn't leave without having an amazing fish meal. You go, oh, this is lovely, fresh, local fish. People don't come to Sussex and have that identity with Sussex, and that's something, you know, what if as a result of the kelp um, restoration, we're seeing a huge increase in the num number of lobsters caught in Sussex, and actually it becomes a thing of like, what, you went to Sussex and you didn't have a lobster meal because the lobster that was from the kelp? You know, we need... It, some of these things is, is, is about cultural change and identity and actually we should all do everything that we can to support the local fishing community and eat local fish. I mean, that's truly sustainable seafood. On, on, on that note, uh, can I thank uh, uh, Henry on, on, on your behalf? Um, and we, we'll learn more as, as things go on about the kelp forest. So, um, we look forward to the second edition, I think, about when there's some progress being made on this. So can I, I thank Henry. <laughs> and, and, and just remind you, this is still part of WordFest. And Rosalind, are you going to say a bit more about the, the programme? Um, we've got Tony Whitbread from Sussex Wildlife Trust on the, uh, Thursday the 3rd of June with the last in the series, it's called What Have Plants Ever Done For Us? So if you haven't already got, got a ticket for that, I hope you come along. Uh, it will also be recorded, so you can buy live stream tickets, and this event has also gone out live stream for some more people. And the other thing is that we're planning another, we're planning a whole environment day for the big work fest in October, October the 2nd, here at Roach Castle, and we're gonna have a whole day of speakers, and we're gonna be thinking about the big, um, planning meetings, international world meetings, global meetings for the environment and particularly for the biosphere. And so we really hope that everybody can come along to that. We're gonna have some fantastic speakers and workshops and it really is about what you want to make of it. If you're interested in getting involved with that, if you just put your name and indicate on your feedback form, then uh, we'll contact you because we're really hoping to build a whole momentum behind the environmental movement. And thank you so much, Henry, for a fantastic talk. And it's just great to hear that so something positive, isn't it, is going on on a doorstep. So thank you again. Bye. <laughs>